today. We have a few more people coming in over the next few minutes. So um, we'll just be a little patient with people coming on in. Um, thank you all for figuring this out, getting on video, the phone, however you were able to. It's really exciting to see so many of you here. And I want to thank you in advance, too, for your um, support, either as a volunteer or through a financial support. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I hope that with everybody home that everyone has gotten some time to go out in their gardens and enjoy nature and really just get to relax right now. I know I've been spending a lot of time out in the garden, um, seeing all the pollinators that are coming in. Um, over the last few weeks, we hosted three Garden for Wildlife webinars for different parts of the state. And then we had a lot of interest in the advanced in the invasive plant topic, which brought us here. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over one second to my colleague, Madison. Um, before we start, um, I just wanted to let you know, so if you all, um, I see most of us are in mute mode right now, so that is perfect. Um, anyone who's not in mute, um, please go ahead and mute your line. If you need help with that, um, feel free to write that in the chat box. And if you have questions that come up during the chat, put them in the chat box and I will relay them over as soon as appropriate. Um, so hopefully during the presentation and if we don't get to it during, then I'll definitely get to it after. So I'm so excited to see you all here and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Madison. Thanks, Tara. Uh, hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm going to go ahead and get in pres presentation mode. So I'm going to turn off my video um, and pull up my screen for you all to see. OK. And Tara, if you can tell me if that's working. It's perfect. OK, great. Awesome. Yeah, so we also are going to be recording this and posting it on our YouTube channel. Um, and also, we will be sending out the slides afterwards, so don't feel like you need to take notes or anything. Um, and uh, just thank you for coming and joining in. I want to give a disclaimer that I am by no means an expert in this area, but I did major in horticulture at NC State, so I will try my very best to answer any questions that you have. Um, and if you do come up with questions, again, uh, please just feel free to type them in the chat and Tara will relay them to me as I go through. Um, so starting with just a little bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about, about uh, what an invasive plant is, why it's invasive, and what impacts it has on our environment. Then I'm going to go over a few plant identification terms that are going to be important in um, understanding what an invasive plant is and, and identifying it correctly. And then I have just a snippet of some invasive plants that are really bad in North Carolina. And then I'll talk a little bit on how to control invasive plant species. Um, so if I'm going too fast, please uh, feel free to let me know and I'll slow down a little bit. Um, but first, I'm going to talk about what an invasive plant is. Uh, so an invasive plant is typically a non-native plant that's introduction to an ecosystem causes or is likely to cause economic harm, ecological harm, or harm to human health. Um, so how did they get here? How did these invasive plants enter our environment? A lot of them are actually brought over for their horticultural value. So uh, maybe horticulturists liked the flowers or the leaves that they had. Um, and so they were brought over to be introduced into our gardens. And unfortunately, a lot of these introduced, um, uh, escaped our garden landscapes and entered our ecosystems and are now causing a lot of problems. Uh, some were also brought over for environmental repair projects and used for stabilization of soil or preventing erosion. Um, some were added to habitat that was deforested and they wanted to uh, put in something green there very quickly to help stabilize soil. Uh, a lot were brought over by accident, either were uh, mixed up on a boat that was moving between lakes or it was mixed up in seed that was traveling across the country. Um, so there were a lot, of, a lot of them that were brought over just on accident and unintentional. Uh, and some were brought over for cooking or for their edible qualities. And one such invasive is the garlic mustard, which can be seen um, in all parts of North Carolina. And it was brought over for its edible qualities. Um, so why is it invasive? Um, not all exotic plants become invasives, but there's a few different qualities of an invasive plant that makes them an issue. 
Um, one of them is that they self-seed or they are pro prolific reseeders. So they produce an abundance of seed that is either uh, dispersed by wind or maybe wildlife eat them and disperse them in the environment. Um, and so they can quickly overtake an ecosystem that way. Uh, they're usually tolerant of disturbed areas as well. So you see a lot of invasives in areas where there's a lot of habitat fragmentation or underneath power lines and along roadsides. Uh, they're very tolerant of those disturbed soils, whereas our natives maybe aren't as adapted to that. Um, they typically have a very aggressive root system. Uh, their, their roots grow very aggressively and their stems and shoots can quickly take over. Um, I'm getting a little bit of background noise. Uh, if you just want to make sure that your phones are muted, uh, that would be really great. Um, uh, but anyway, so their aggressive root systems and shoots can quickly overtake a, a natural area. Uh, another important uh, characteristic is that these invasive plants, when they were taken out of their homeland and, and brought to the United States, were taking them out of areas where they typically have natural predators that will um, eat, eat the leaves and help reduce their plant number, or there's a lot of diseases that help keep their uh, plant number in check. But when we take them out of that natural environment and put them into this new environment, those natural predators and diseases are almost eliminated. Um, so their populations can quickly get um, uh, just increase abundantly. And one example of this is the in invasive Chinese silvergrass. Uh, this is typically found along interstates uh, in the mountains, along roadsides. Uh, this is a very prominent plant on those roadsides in those disturbed areas. And you can see it, it's where all these white plumes are uh, of these grasses. Uh, that's all invasive uh, Chinese silver grass. Uh, so, so what are the impacts of invasive species? They're a, a big concern because invasive species have contributed to the decline of 42% of the U.S. endangered and threatened species. Um, and that percentage, percentage is looking at both animal, animals, uh, invasive plants, and invasive microorganisms, but we're going to focus mainly on the invasive plants today. Um, so how do they affect our ecosystems? They're a huge concern because they uh, severely decrease our native plant diversity. Uh, they can quickly overtake areas and smother our native plants and outcompete our native plants, which uh, in turn will restrict the diets of our wildlife. Um, for example, birds who are flying through and they, they need something to eat before they continue their journey, they will often land in invasive plant areas. And because they're the only plant there, they'll eat their seeds or their fruit, which just aids in the dispersal and makes the issue worse. This reduction of native plant habitat um, also reduces the habitat for our native wildlife. So uh, box turtles and caterpillars who eat herbaceous plants or other ground dwelling animals that rely on the native uh, uh, habitat and the native plants, they are quickly overlooked because of the introduction of invasive plant species. And this in turn weakens our biodiversity and our resiliency, which is really important, especially in the face of climate change and, and increased hurricane frequency and the strength of our storms. Um, one such way that an invasive can change our ecology and our environments um, is by increasing the intensity or the frequency of fires. Fires are typically um, prescribed fires that are controlled, but a lot of times uh, such as this invasive clematis in the tree canopies, it acts as extra burning material, which uh, further damages the tree canopies, which is an unintended consequence. Uh, so just keeping that in mind of how it can change our ecosystems is really important. Before I get into the uh, little plant sample I have invasive, of invasive plants, I wanted to give you a few definitions and identification tools just to help you uh, have those tools in your memory for when you go out and identify invasive plants. Uh, so the first two are evergreen and deciduous. An evergreen plant is one that retains its leaves year round like the American holly, whereas a deciduous one loses its leaves in the fall, such as a red maple. Uh, and there's also woody versus herbaceous. Uh, a woody plant is a hardwood like your oaks or azaleas. And a herbaceous is more of a softwood or a succulent texture such as your milkweeds or grasses. 
And then one other definition that seems kind of silly, but I, I want to make sure we go over it, is uh, the definition of a leaf. Uh, so when you uh, look at a leaf, the way you would identify the entire leaf is you start at the top and you follow it all the way down until you find the first bud. Um, and that's really important because there are also some leaves that have leaflets, which are, which are just a smaller portion of a leaf. So for the same way, you identify the leaf starting at the top and you can continue until you find the first bud. And so there aren't typically buds at the end of a leaflet. And so this entire leaf is the, um, uh, is the whole leaf. So there's simple leaves like our oak trees, and then there's compound leaves, which have the leaflets, and those are more like our hickories or our Virginia creeper. Um, another important uh, identification tool is looking at the leaf pattern on the stem. Uh, so up here we have alternate versus opposite leaf patterns. The alternate leaf pattern is where you look and you see two leaves that are on either side of the stem, but they do not meet at the same point, and they meet alternately. So that's an alternate leaf pattern. And if you look at the opposite leaf pattern, there's two leaves and they meet at the same point. And so that is the opposite leaf pattern. And those are really key um, in understanding and using an identification of invasive plant species or really any plant species. Okay, so there's about 75 invasive plants total in North Carolina, and that includes uh, trees, shrubs, aquatic plants and other herbaceous plants. Um, and so there are others that are listed as concerns, and they're not quite invasive yet, but they're on a watch list. Um, but there are uh, roughly around 75 that are definitely invasive in North Carolina. And as you'll see when I start to go through them, um, many of them are from Asia. And I just wanted to point out that that's actually due to our similar climates. Uh, there's a lot of similar uh, climate characteristics between uh, the southeast here and in, in Asia. So just to point that out. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about is the Bradford pear. Uh, this is your kind of lollipop tree that's um, often planted in suburban landscapes. This is actually native to China and it was brought over for crossbreeding with other pear trees. It's, uh, it was eventually introduced as an ornamental tree, which is why you see them so commonly planted in suburban homes. Um, and it's got these invasive qualities as it self seeds and it hybridizes very quickly and easily. And you can see how it's taken over this um, natural area that's here underneath a power line. All of these white blooming trees are Bradford pears. Um, and the way you identify it is that it's a deciduous woody tree. It has alternate simple leaves and the leaves are very glossy and a dark green color and, and they're often oval shaped. Uh, they have white blooms in the spring, which is what you see here in this picture, and they smell terrible. They smell like a dumpster. <laughs> so that's uh, another way that you can tell whether or not it's a Bradford pear. Uh, here we have the princess tree. It was native to China and was brought as an ornamental tree. Um, it's got these very pretty flowers, which I believe is why it was brought over. Um, it's got very pretty flowers and it's fast growing and has these very large um, leaves, but it self seeds very easily and it's a very fast growing tree. And so you can see here, this is actually an image here on the bottom of an area that was recently um, had a prescribed burn. You can see the black marks on the trees where the prescribed burn went through. And this here is the princess tree and you can see it just taking over the understory of this of this um, environment. And so it's fast growing, it's growing back before other native plants have a chance and it's shading them out because of their large leaves. Um, so it's a fast growing woody tree. It has opposite simple leaves that are a very large heart shape and it produces a sticky green oval fruit and it has winged seeds that are, they're kind of similar to like um, our maple tree seeds. Uh, but this is a, a very um, prominent invasive plant. Uh, here we have the mimosa tree. It was introduced from Eastern and Southwest Asia and it was brought over as an ornamental tree. It has a very tropical look and has very interesting flowers, but the uh, root system of it is very aggressive. It'll send up different um, suckers, creating these very dense groves of trees. 
Uh, the seeds are also viable and can be dispersed by animals. Uh, it's an ornamental woody tree that has alternate compound leaves. So this entire leaf here, this is all one leaf, and it's a very fern-like um, looking leaf. It has fragrant feathery flowers that bloom in the spring. Um, we always called them firework flowers or, or fireworks because they just look like they're exploding. And they have these oblong seed pods. I had a friend who had this tree in her backyard and it was, a, it was crazy, I remember it so vividly. Uh, there was a, it was a full sunny day and it was so pitch black looking into the back of her yard. You could not see anything um, but a few feet back from the mimosa groves. It's as black as it looks in this picture here. Um, so it can very easily shade out our native plant species. Uh, here we have autumn olive. This is native to China, Japan, and Korea. It's used, it was brought over and used in habitat restoration and erosion control, uh, but unfortunately it became uh, very out of control and it was, uh, it was also used in ornamental plantings because it has a very um, nice flower and leaf color, uh, but it was very quickly considered an invasive plant as it took over a lot of areas. It produces um, fruit that have viable seed and it has this very dense habit that shades out native plants. Uh, it's a woody shrub, it has alternate simple leaves, and on the bottom side of the leaf, it's like a silvery color. Uh, it produces yellow and white tubular flowers that kind of hang down in clusters from the stems, um, and it blooms in early spring. It's actually done blooming now. It um, was blooming in late March, early April, um, and it produces red, small red fruits that are, again, very attractive to wildlife and aid in its dispersal. Uh, here we have kudzu, which is probably the most infamous uh, invasive plant. Many of you have probably seen this um, scene before. It was brought over and used as an ornamental, but also for erosion control because it has uh, fast growing habits and a very aggressive root system. Um, and that's how it became invasive. It grows very aggressively and you can see it's just completely smothered um, anything that's been, uh, that would have been growing in this area on the edge of this forest. It spreads by runners and by rhizomes and is very suitable to disturbed habitat, which is why you typically see them on um, fragmented habitat that's on the edge of edges of a forest. Uh, it's, there's lots of sun that's there, so it creates this very suitable habitat and it just completely grows over all the edges of these trees um, as it reaches for more sunlight. And it's a woody vine, it has alternate compound leaves the compound leaves have three leaflets, and the leaves can be round or they can be lobed. The flowers are purple and fragrant and they have flat seed pods. Um, and so this is definitely just a very aggressive plant that you want to make sure that you remove from your yard uh, before it takes over like this. Uh, here we have the Japanese honeysuckle. This is native to Japan and Eastern Asia and it was brought over and used as an ornamental. Um, it's actually blooming right now, and there's a ton of it over um, along this greenway that I live very close to, and it smells wonderful, which is probably why it was first introduced as an ornamental. It has um, these very nice flowers, but it spreads by runners and rhizomes that um, are very aggressive and can take over other native plants. It smothers shrubs and tr uh, small trees, and it produces these black seeds that are um, eaten and dispersed by birds. Um, but it's a woody vine. It has opposite simple leaves. Uh, the fragrant flowers in the spring, they smell wonderful. Um, it's very unfortunate that this is invasive. Uh, the flowers are yellow, white, and they're trumpet shaped. And the leaves are oblong and smooth. And I don't know about you, but my childhood was wrecked when I found out this was invasive. Uh, I remember growing up and, and picking off the flowers and sucking the nectar. So it was very shocking when I found out this, this was invasive. And I'm sure many of you uh, probably did the same thing. Uh, here we have Oriental Bittersweet. This is native to China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, it's used as an ornamental, um, but its seeds are dispersed by birds. And the seeds are actually these bright red seeds here. The berries are actually yellow. Uh, it's an aggressive grower that smothers plants and it spreads by rhizomes. You can see here as it wraps around the tree how much it's uh, strangling and girdling the tree. 
Uh, it's a woody vine. It has alternate simple leaves. The leaves are glossy, oval shaped, and they have these little serrations here on the leaf margin. Uh, they produce yellow berries, but again, uh, that bright red seed kind of bursts through and they're, they persist through the winter, making them very attractive to birds and aiding in their dispersal. Um, they look a lot like holly berries, uh, but they grow up in the trees and the, and the birds catch, it catches their eye and then they eat them and uh, it gets dispersed that way. Uh, here we have English ivy. This is native to Europe and is used as an ornamental. Um, this plant was typically used as a ground cover and it, you can see it's completely taken over the ground, uh, choking out any other native plants that would have been growing there. It's spread by runners and the wildlife disperse uh, its seeds. Uh, but one interesting fact um, about the seed production is that when the English ivy is growing horizontally, it's actually in its immature stage. And that's when it has its lobed leaves. When it becomes mature, it has to grow up something vertically. So when it's growing up a tree or a building, uh, that actually initiates it to change to a mature stage and that's when it produces seeds. Um, but other than that, it blocks out sunlight and it will also smother trees as you can see it growing up um, on these trees here. It's a very heavy woody vine. It has alternate simple leaves. The dark, uh, it has dark green leaves that have white veins. Again, the leaves will be lobed if it's immature and it will be oval if, it, if it's mature. And the mature vines will produce a yellow flower. Um, we just have a quick question, Madison, um, yeah, totally. back, on the, back on the last slide. Is there a native or a wild of the honeysuckle variety? Sorry, that's actually not in that slide, but yeah, uh, this that one. one. Yes, uh, yes, there are native um, honeysuckles. There is the coral honeysuckle. Um, I'm sure there's a few, a few more, but I actually have the coral honeysuckle and it's um, just like a pinkish color. There are um, native ones, yes. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's um, Mile a Minute Vine. This is native to East Asia and India. It was accidentally introduced when seed was mixed with imported holly seeds. And it forms these very dense mats of tangled stems that smother other plants and things that it's growing up, um, growing up on top of. And the fruit and seed are dispersed by wildlife. It's a herbaceous annual vine that has alternate simple leaves, and they have these triangular shaped leaves that are kind of shaped like an arrowhead, and uh, the leaves are a very bright green color. They produce these very bright blue berries, which um, is very interesting to me because you don't typically see such a blue color in nature, um, and I actually found this on a walk last year, and I did not know what it was until I was putting together this presentation, so it was uh, very interesting to see uh, this bright blue berry in, in the wild. Um, just a quick question, Madison. Do yeah. do these have thorns? Yes, this this one does. Um, the mile a minute vine has these small little barbs, uh, and you can kind of see them here on the on the stems here. Uh, you have to be very careful when you're removing it. Um, Great. I don't Thank think you. the other ones that I've mentioned yet have thorns or Thank barbs. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so you do have to be careful when you're removing this plant because it's got these small barbs. You want to make sure you're wearing gloves, long sleeve shirt, and long pants just to make sure that you um, are protecting yourself when you're removing it. Uh, here we have the Chinese and Japanese wisteria. Both are invasive um, and they look very similar, uh, but, but one's native to China and one's native to Japan. They are brought over and used as an ornamental plant. Uh, they have these very beautiful pendulate uh, flowers that bloom in the spring, but it's a very heavy vine that strangles trees and shrubs, and it's dispersed by runners, making it a very weedy tree. Um, I actually witnessed this uh, vine growing up a telephone pole, and it was very heavy on the telephone pole. The city has since come and removed, um, removed it because it, it was getting very dangerous and heavy. Um, in other places in, in NC State, it's um, growing up these arbors, and it's a very mature uh, vine, but you can see other runners that have been running underground, and they pop up from underneath the bricks. You can just um, tell how 
uh, how tough this plant is and how far the runners can go. Um, it's a woody vine. It has alternate compound leaves. This, this whole leaf here is the, the compound leaf. It produces these drooping lavender color flowers that are very fragrant. They smell really nice. Um, uh, but again, they, they are invasive. So we want to make sure that we are taking care of it in a responsible manner. Uh, the leaflets are wavy. They have this wavy margin on the end. And uh, the main difference between our invasive wisteria and our native wisteria is that the invasive ones have velvety seed pods, whereas our native wisteria has smooth seed pods. Um, otherwise, it can be very difficult to tell them apart. Um, here we have the Japanese privet. Um, this is native to Japan and other parts of Asia. It was uh, used as an ornamental and also I think I read that it was used in riparians before the edges of waterways. But it does have some invasive qualities. The seeds are dispersed by birds and it has a very dense growth habit. You can see how, um, how large it is in this picture and how dark it gets um, right underneath the shrub. Um, but it's an evergreen woody shrub. It has opposite simple leaves. It has small white fragrant clusters of flowers um, and it's actually blooming right now. Um, I went on a walk just the other day and found this um, blooming along uh, the greenway. So it's blooming now if you want to keep an eye out for it. Um, and it does produce uh, these black and blue uh, fruit that ripen in the fall, which again make it very attractive as um, birds and other animals begin to um, prepare for winter. Uh, here we have the burning bush. This is native to Eastern Asia. It was used as an ornamental, typically in shrub plantings or as screen plantings. Um, and it's also planted along highways as well. Um, the fruit are eaten and dispersed by, um, dispersed by wildlife. And you can see how it's taken over this understory here in this um, roadside habitat. It's a woody shrub that has opposite simple leaves. Uh, the leaves turn this very bright red in the fall, which make them a very attractive as an ornamental plant. Um, but unfortunately, it, can, it has escaped gardens and entered into other ecosystems. Uh, you can also identify it because they typically have these woody wings on the branches. You can see along the stem here, these little um, woody wings here that are very typical of this plant. And again, they produce a bright red fruit that is often eaten by wildlife. Um, this is alligator weed. This is actually an invasive aquatic plant that was um, introduced from South America. They aren't entirely sure how it got here, um, but it's suspected to have arrived through waterways um, or maybe through um, a boat. Uh, but it has these very aggressive root systems uh, that quickly can take over other native aquatic plants. And another uh, invasive feature it has is that even though uh, it can sometimes be chopped up, those chopped up pieces, as long as they include a node, which is where the bud is, like where I'm circling here, this is the node. As long as the node is intact, those will take root and just, um, uh, again, take root and contribute to the masses that uh, end up clogging our waterways. Uh, it clogs our waterways and it weakens biodiversity, uh, which is typically um, or, or very frequently a problem, especially when there's flooding that occurs because it reduces the amount of flow of water and can cause really severe flooding. Um, but it's a herbaceous aquatic plant. It has opposite simple leaves. Uh, the leaves are this oblong shape. Uh, the flowers uh, it flowers through the growing season, and the flowers resemble, resemble clover flowers, which you can see here is a very similar to a clover flower. Um, here we have the butterfly bush, which is a very popular ornamental plant. Um, it's actually native to China, but it was used and brought over uh, uh, for horticulture purposes. It's a prolific reseeder. It it's, uh, attracts a lot of pollinators, and so pollinators uh, do what they do and they pollinate it and it reseeds and can create these very dense thickets that block out natives. Um, it's a deciduous woody shrub that has opposite simple leaves. Uh, it has these nice arching stems and on the top um, or at the ends of each arching stem there's a fragrant cone-shaped flower, panicles of flowers that are very, very attractive to pollinators. 
it, it does provide a, a lot of nectar, but it really has no other value as like a larval host plant. Um, and, and due to its invasive nature, it's really best to steer away from this um, plant as a nectar plant and instead plant something else. Um, one plant that has some a very similar uh, feature as far as the shape of the flowers and the abundance of flowers that are so attractive to pollinators is a uh, sweet pepper bush or clethra alnifolia. Um, this is a really good plant to help replace the butterfly bush and it's native. Um, but this is observed as invasive typically um, in the mountains and in the Piedmont. So if you live in those areas, you may want to um, think about looking for other alternatives or there is a, I believe, a sterile butterfly bush that is on the market as well. Um, the last plant I have for you today is a tree of heaven. This is native to China and it's used as an ornamental plant. Um, the seeds are dispersed by wind, but it, uh, the, the main problem with this plant is that it has these allelopathic properties um, where the root system is releasing a chemical into the soil that is preventing other plants from growing up underneath it. Um, and because of these allelopathic properties, it can quickly overrun natural areas as it kills off anything that's around it and allows it to reseed. Um, it's a deciduous woody tree that has alternate compound leaves. It can have 10 to 40 leaflets, and you can see how many leaflets are just on one leaf. It makes a very distinct texture of the tree, um, and it flowers typically in the middle of summer. Um, so there are a few ways to remove invasive plants. Uh, the, the main three ways to remove them are through mechanical, chemical, or biocontrol um, practices. Mechanical practices include mowing, pulling, or cutting back invasive plants. Another um, common way to, to kill off invasive is through a solarization method, which is when you basically uh, lay down a tarp and leave it for several weeks or months and allow the sun to heat up the ground underneath it. And it'll actually kill everything, but uh, this is a good method to use if there's an, a, a huge abundance of invasive plants that is really hard to get rid of. Uh, but it's also very important when you are pulling up or cutting back uh, uh, invasives is to remove the roots as much as possible to prevent regeneration. Uh, there's also chemical ways of controlling invasive plants, typically through herbicides. Uh, you can use a foliar spray, but it's actually um, better, particularly for shrubs and trees, if you cut the plant as far back to the ground as possible and then just apply an herbicide to the remaining stump. This is a very direct way to apply an herbicide, and as long as it's not going to rain, it's um, a pretty safe as it's not going to uh, have much drift onto nearby plants as a foliar spray might. Uh, another control method is through biocontrol, and this is basically using natural predators to help control invasive populations. And there's a ton of research going on in this area. Um, uh, one example is kudzu. Uh, lots of People are using goats to try and help eat the kudzu because they'll they'll eat it. Um, but it's a also, or sorry, there's also a, a success story in the use of specialist insects. A specialist insect is an insect like the monarch caterpillar where it only eats one plant. And so that removes any other uh, harm that could cause, could be caused by introducing another invasive bug or something into our ecosystems, we want to an, introduce the native herbivores of the invasive plant. And so this was a success story with the alligator weed stem borer. Um, that was the aquatic plant that we mentioned. Uh, this was introduced successfully and is helping to control invasive plant populations for the alligator weed. Um, if you are interested in checking out other resources on methods to remove invasive plants, you can take a look at uh, the citations that I used and read about other ways to remove invasive plants, but also just check with experts. Uh, the most preferred method is definitely mechanical. Um, this causes less harm to native wildlife so, because you're being selective on what invasive plants you're removing and how you go about removing them. It also redu reduces the risk of killing natives, um, whereas herbicides may 
uh, spread to other native plants. This is reducing your risk of killing them because you're being so selective. And then you also reduce the risk of introducing another invasive species. Uh, biocontrol research is still very young and it can often go in a wrong direction. Uh, the flowerhead weevil was introduced from Europe to help eat an invasive European thistle, um, but it actually has had adverse effects on eating our native thistles as well. So uh, mechanical is, is definitely the preferred method um, uh, of removal. And the best way to protect our environment is to advocate for it. Um, I encourage you to help pass policies that reduce habitat fragmentation, which is giving invasives just more room for growth. Uh, maybe volunteer with an invasive plant removal group. Uh, again, promote native plants for gardens. A lot of these plants were introduced for our gardens. And so if we can promote our native plants, we can prevent the spread of other invasives. And I also encourage you to get involved with an NCWF chapter. We have several over, um, over North Carolina. If you want to get involved, please um, let me or Tara know. Our in contact information is on the next page. Um, and you can also visit our website. And if there's not a chapter in your area, we would love to help you start one. Uh, and I cannot emphasize this enough that I, I encourage you to check with experts and confirm with them if you have found an invasive plant or not on your yard. Uh, and there are many native lookalikes. So you wanna make sure that you're doing your research and um, checking with experts uh, to make sure that you are removing the one that's bad. Uh, check with your local extension agents. Try the iNaturalist app. There is an app that you can take a picture of the plant and it'll give you a list of possibilities that it is to try and help you narrow it down. Um, so that's a really good app as well for um, identifying invasives. And then email your experts. If you would like to email me or Tara, we would love to try and help you um, figure out what invasives are in your yard and help you do any research that you may need uh, to help make the best decisions. Uh, and so again, here's our emails and then our website is also ncwf.org if you would like to check out any chapters um, or get in contact with us. Um, but other than that, thank you for joining my invasive plant uh, webinar. If you have any questions, I would love to hear them. Perfect. Thank you so much, Madison. I'm definitely inspired to get out there and remove some invasives from my yard, my community. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, and I, I'm sure we all got a lot out of this, this chat. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat. So from Nita, I planted Japanese Pitosporum years ago. It is invasive in the woods and surrounding property. Any advice? Um, is that a herbaceous or woody plant? Um, we will follow up with her if she, if she's not. Oh, it's a shrub. Shrub. She it's said. a shrub. Yeah. Yeah. So so removing it, um, uh, like I had mentioned, by cutting it back down to the stump and then applying an herbicide to to the um, to the stump is definitely a good way to help prevent it from regenerating. If it is uh, such a big issue in your area, that's a good way to remove it. It may take some time and lots of going back out and, and finding it again and making sure that they're not coming up. Uh, but that's the, the main way that I would suggest to remove it. Great, thank you. And thank you to Morganton for the comment in there as well. Um, we have a question, um, a statement. Can you please cover the importance of the time of year for the chemical treatments and also the practical issues of using goats? Yeah, so um, I don't know if I'm uh, enough informed to talk about the seasonality of using herbicides. Uh, you do want to make sure that you're using them when it's not going to be uh, really rainy so that it doesn't spread to other other plants. Uh, for the goat issue, um, it's definitely something that you have to read the context for for whatever your situation is. I'm not sure if there are any particulars that you are thinking of. And if you would like to share them in the chat, I encourage you because I'm not as familiar with that, um, with the issues with it. Yeah, great. And we can follow up um, as well with um, some of the information after the chat. So um, thank you, Madison. Um, uh, is poison ivy considered an invasive? 
That is a great question. I actually learned this not too long ago. It's actually a native plant. Um, so it is not invasive, but it can often be defined as weedy. Um, it, it can be uh, kind of like a pest in your garden or in your um, in your landscape, but it's not actually invasive. Um, it's just kind of annoying. <laughs> great, thank you. Um, I think someone is looking for um, an uprooter or, oh, that, that was just a comment. Um, this person has a weed that they call bindweed. They have a very long root system. Any suggestions about killing it? Um, they have used Roundup and it is helping, but there's so much of it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can be very challenging. Um, I'm not sure if you're using Roundup, that's really the best way you have to really make sure that you're being persistent in using it and making sure that um, you're using it consistently so that you it, are exhausting the root system because um, it's probably still coming up because the root system is uh, still getting uh, it still has nutrients to provide regeneration so it really could take a few months to a few years as long as you are consistent though um, it can help deter it from regenerating. Perhaps using mechanical tools um, and doing sections at a time to help pull up root systems could be another way to help control it. Great, and we can follow up with you on that, Teresa, um, with some more information. Thank you, Madison. Um, do you know of a person or service that would come to do a census of your yard and its plants? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, that would be a question for your local extension agents. I know that um, they will have a lot more resources uh, for your local area. And oftentimes people are able to come out and um, check your yard. Yeah, great. Yeah, and I think I think if the um, agent is not able to come soon too, if you wanted to reach out to us, we could maybe have a chapter leader come on by and take a look at um, what's in your yard. That's another potential option. Um, Okay, let me see. Should I still remove honeysuckle and privet if the deer are eating it? That is a good question. Yeah, so um, that is a good question. <laughs> it's, it's really hard to say whether there's a correct answer or not. Um, my thought would be to go ahead and remove it because the danger of it taking over other invasive species and degrading the deer's habitat could also pose a threat other than it just um, providing a food source for it. There are other native plants that deer could eat. Um, deer are really open to eating anything. They'll, they'll eat like wood and sticks in the winter. So they're a very tough um, population and they, they'll eat anything. So if you could replace the invasive with something native, that would uh, you what I would recommend, um, but it really is based on the context of your area and, and what you would like to do. Great. Yeah, and we can follow up um, with a few options for a different plant to put in, um, Susan. Um, we have someone, I, I joined late, so I'm not sure if you covered this, but we have a ton of Chinese silver grass that I've been removing mechanically. Was that on your list today? And I, I think she might be, be looking for a tip. Yeah, um, China, we mentioned it in the beginning of the PowerPoint. It's uh, definitely a really bad invasive, especially along roadsides and the mountains. Um, if you're removing it mechanically, that's really the, the best way. It just takes a long time. Um, if you, uh, something that I could probably recommend just to help, um, I'm wondering if maybe removing the seed heads before they reseed would help at least in slowing down the spread of the Chinese silver grass. Uh, but other than that, mechanical removal or uh, maybe if it's a really bad problem, you could try a chemical spray uh, could also help make it less of an issue. Great, thank you. Um, what is the best way to get rid of English ivy in a large wooded area? Yeah, so English ivy is pretty, pretty tough and tricky. It may take um, several months to to do it mechanically. Uh, one way that you could do it is to take your mower and to just mow down the the invasive or 
to mow down the English ivy and to do that repeatedly throughout the year. And then maybe use your pruners and as you mow, mow through it, use your pruners and clip the ivy um, roots that are just on the ground um, and a little bit underground and then remove whatever roots you can. Um, doing it in sections helps makes it manageable. Um, so, so mowing down a section, cutting the roots of the vine and removing them and then uh, either safely burning that material or letting it dry out. Don't compost it because the comp it could re-sprout in the compost. Um, so letting it dry out and die completely before um, taking it to um, your, your yard waste removal facility um, would be a good way to remove it and help make it more manageable. Great, thank you. Um, we had a question if we'll be able to provide the presentation in a PDF so we can reference later. Yes, absolutely. We're going to uh, make a PDF version and we'll email that to you um, by the end of today. Perfect. Uh, we just had a tip from Meg Millard saying bindweed needs careful digging out um, and get all the roots. So thank you for that tip, Meg. Um, and chickens awesome. are, get, are good at getting rid of bindweed as well. Um, okay, let me just continue on down. Um, okay. Uh, Surprised to hear that you recommend Roundup. Hasn't the glyphosate in that been proved to cause cancer and other issues? Yes, that is a, a huge research um, that's happening right now. Uh, I don't, I'm going to just uh, decline to comment further. I don't want to give any other personal opinions, but just uh, make sure that you are reading the labels correctly, wearing the appropriate equipment, and making sure that you are uh, reading the best times to spray them and to do them safely. That's all I can recommend. Great, yeah, and I think as as Aunt Madison went through there, there are a few different options. So the like mechanical is the like preferred option. So um, that was just something that someone had brought up as another possibility, depending upon how bad the um, situation is. But I appreciate you including that question in here, Christy. It's it's definitely relevant. Um, okay, let me see. Um, Jane has a tip. Audubon has a program to evaluate natives and non-natives. Thank you. Um, okay. Let me see if there's any more questions. Okay, I think, um, did I miss anyone's questions? If I missed anyone's questions, please type in the bottom of the chat right now. I think I covered them all. We have some other great tips in here. Um, I would like to actually save this um, information and we can email this over to you guys too. I appreciate all of the great comments. We have an extension office link um, in here. So this is really great. We have a great group of people on the call who are clearly very passionate about plants, just like we are. So um, I appreciate that. And thank you, Madison. This, this, this presentation was so helpful. I know I learned a lot. I'm sure everyone else got a lot out of it. Um, yeah, thank you. thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. If you have any more questions, feel free to email me. Perfect. And thank you all so much. Um, we'll, we'll hang on the line for just a few more seconds in case anyone has a really important question in the back of their head that they're just typing down. Um, but thank you all so much. Have a great day. Get out in your yards, plant, plant some natives, um, enjoy everything out there. If you have any more questions, send us an email. Thank you all.